Okay. Okay. All right. Can everyone see that? Absolutely. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, so this here is a technique that I use for making for making small boats. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm doing this as a PDF, I guess. Yeah. Well, with the PDF, I could probably let me see this if it works. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Okay. I could do it that way. All right. Hang on, I gotta get back to the beginning again. Here it is over here. Okay, good. All right, so basically what I'm gonna, this short talk on, and I, I wanna tell you that this is, this is not um, an original technique. This is something that I've learned over the years from various people, I guess Jim Roberts, if you might remember Jim and some other people. But, um, uh, there are many ways to make small open boats. If you're working in a large enough scale, uh, there are ways to, to, to plank it over a plug. Um, you make a plug and then you plank over the plug. I'm working an eighth inch scale. And an eighth inch scale, trying to plank an eighth inch scale, understanding that most small boats are planked with planking about three quarters of an inch thick or maybe thinner uh, is really kind of silly. So um, this is my technique for making boats in scales uh, below uh, 3 16 um, um, All right. All right. So depending on how small a boat is, you can choose to simply carve the hull from a single block of wood. It requires a good deal of estimating of the shape of the hull. Uh, I use what's called the lift method. Um, basically what the lift method is, and I'll describe what the lift method is. As an aside to this, something that people um, may know, may not know, um, uh, if you uh, look at the models that are in the Rogers collection, the, um, the models built in the uh, 18th century and um, maybe 19th century, um, we, especially when you're building um, um, sailing ships and wooden ships, we obsess about planking, we obsess about framing and that kind of thing. And then you go and you look at the models in the Rogers collections and, and Rob Napier has a book on, um, on the, the Royal, Royal Carolyn that he had to, uh, that he had to repair uh, in the Rogers collection uh, for the Naval Academy. And what you will find there is that those models up to the lowest deck are actually built using the lift method. And, and the planking is actually scribed on the hull. So lift method has been around for quite a while. And, you know, so if you're going to paint it, it works fine. So here's a typical plan. And to do the lift method properly, can you see the hand here? I think you can. Okay, let's use the selector tool instead. Okay, can't see, I can see this from better. Okay, you can see the hand on the screen. Okay, so this is a plan that I took for a 24 inch launch that I took out of the Anatomy of the Ship series. And I think this was the Blanford or whatever. And the reason why I took these uh, plans out of that book is because they show a shear plan and they show a body plan and they show a, 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 um, a, a lift, a, um, yeah, it'll come to me. Anyway, but it's a three view, okay? So each one of these lines here correspond to a lift line here, okay? So what you're going to do is in this case, there are one, two, three lifts. So in this case, you're gonna take three strips of wood and you're gonna cut them out on this line and then you're just gonna stack them together. So, all right. There are four boats on the Liverpool. The Anatomy of Ship series usually has plans for open boats that are detailed enough for our purposes. However, boats are of various sizes based on the length, basically the sizes of the crew of the ship. Uh, the best plans were in HMS Diana. However, HMS Diana is larger than Liverpool, had larger boats. So I needed to convert 
the two largest boats to meet the needs of a 28 gun six six a uh, 28 gun sixth rate uh, sixth rate frigate. So, in the in the book Diana, here's a plan for a 32 foot pinnace. Well, I need a 28 foot pinnace. Okay. Uh, it was in 148 scale, which is very convenient because you just half it and you get to 196. Uh, the problem was that I needed a shorter boat. Now, your knee-jerk reaction tells you, okay, well, I'll just, I'll just copy it. And, and, and one good thing about, about printers now, printers today, I happen to have an HP printer, but I'm sure Canon and other printers do as well. It's a lot better than a Xerox machine because you could really dial in what um, what reduction factor you want to put it on, and it comes out pretty much accurate, okay? Of course, you're locked into eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper, but for most of the work I do, that's big enough. So um, understanding that I have to get this boat four feet shorter, four scale feet shorter, okay, um, how are you going to do that? Understanding that you're going to have fewer thoughts because it has a smaller crew. Okay. So what we do is that's the area that I have to remove the cross hatched area. Can everybody see that cross hatching? Okay. Yeah, okay. So, that, so that's the area that has to be removed. Now I judiciously placed it into two areas at the dead flat section of the, of the plan, at the midship section of the boat, and I also put it on either side of a thwart so that when I put the thing together, okay, I have the right number of thwarts, okay? All right, so now here's the 28 foot plan versus the 32 foot plan. Uh, these, this plan is pretty smooth. This plan is pretty smooth. That plan, not so much. There's a little bit of a hump here, but frankly, I could I could fix that when I'm when I'm carving. Okay, now selecting wood, we cut each lift and glue it onto a piece. We we cut each lift out of paper. We glue it onto each lift, and then we need a wood that carves easily. It should have no knots or sap. It should be of uniform color if I decide not to paint the finished product. Frankly, basswood works the best. It's cheap, it cuts and carves very easily. And if you're gonna paint it, uh, you put some wipe on poly on it, you paint over the wipe on poly and you don't have a problem with the fuzz. Uh, I, also, I also typically cut the two sides of the hull separately rather than one big piece. And the reason why I do that is you glue the two halves together and you automatically have a center line. The other reason why I do that is I will make the plans short, um, um, narrower by, the, by half of the, of the width of the keel piece so what I do is I'll glue the two pieces together on the keel. So the keel's already in place. I'll, you'll have some pictures here. I'll show you what I'm doing. Okay. So in this photograph you here, you see I have um, the plan glued to one side. I've cut it out already. And then what I did is I put the keel piece between the two pieces. This is the piece of wood that's going to form the keel. Okay. All right. Uh, I cut the lifts using a scroll saw. It's very delicate work. I showed you my, my Excalibur saw. That's what I use to cut the lifts. You can do the same with a coping saw. You could do the same thing with a jeweler saw. Uh, jeweler saw works well. Uh, you just have to, you have to, you need a bench extension um, that you can get from Micromark. The other thing you need to remember is if you're using a bench extension and you're using a, a jeweler's saw, you want to have the blade so that, the, so that it cuts on the downstroke, so that as you're cutting, it, it automatically clamps itself to the bench extension. It doesn't, it doesn't, because if you, if you did it the other way where you were cutting on the upstroke, every time you did an upstroke, the thing would be trying to lift itself. So you don't want to do that. Okay. The other thing is the top lift, 
okay? We keep the piece that we cut. Here's the piece that I cut out, okay? And, well, let me get a piece that I could fit in here. I had one. Oh, let's do it this way. Uh, come on, I had the thing right here and I lost it. All right, makes no difference, okay. But if you could see, the reason why I do that is I take the piece that I cut out and I put it back inside. And the reason why I do that is so when I lay it on the bed of the scroll saw, I can now cut out the shear. I could now cut out the shear on the top, okay? So let's go to some pictures. Okay, here you see all the lifts stacked on top of each other. So to minimize the amount of carving and sanding later, I also cut out the inside as well with the scroll saw. But I don't cut the bottommost lift. You can see my see the hand indicator here. I do not cut this bottom lift for two reasons. First reason is it's going to be the base that I'm going to build everything on. The second reason is is that you're not gonna be able to see it anyway. There's a grating that rests on top of it or planking that rests on top of it. So, so, so carving it out all the way to the bottom of the craft in this scale really doesn't make any sense. You don't have to do it. Okay, so here are the plans laid out and you notice how I hollowed out. This is to minimize the amount of carving I have to do later. The hull is in two halves. The reason for that is the stem, keel, and stern post assembly is sandwiched sandwich between the two halves. And I have to spell halves, right? Note also that the lowest lift is left solid. Before you carve the inside, it is important that you completely carve the outside. So I'm carving it in two halves. I carve the outside first. Okay, I carve the outside first. What I do is I lay them on top of each other. I lay the lifts on top of each other. And then I take a pencil and I, 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 I line where the two lifts come together. And the reason why I do that is I know when I'm carving the outside, I know that I have to leave about a 32nd of an inch, of an inch to that line or I'm not going to be able to glue the things together. I'm going to punch right through the hole. Okay. What stays and what goes, when you stack up the lifts, the black line is what stays. The red stays in and everything else is removed. Once you finish the outside, it is a good practice to mark the thickness of the hull on the top of the boat shear with a compass. So all I do is I take a compass, uh, I, I take a compass, all right, and I just run it along the shear. You know, I, I set I set the I set it for the thickness of the shear, and I just run it down the side. Okay, to mark to mark the shear to mark how thick the shear is, so I know how 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 deep to carve. Again, understanding that you have to complete the to all of the outside fitting has to be done first. Okay, so here are. The lifts laid out on my stock. Notice that the topmost list lift is thicker. And the reason why it's thicker is because I'm going to cut the shear out of there. Here are the paper patterns for the shear. Okay, so what will happen is, is I'll cut that out. I'll put the plug back in. Then I'll glue this on there. When I put the plug back in, I glue it in place over paper. So I'll, 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 I'll glue the paper in, I'll lay the, I'll lay the cutout plug up against the paper and glue that on. This way, when I go to break the two apart, the paper just breaks. And then I scrape the paper off when I'm carving. Okay, more details here. Okay, the shear is cut. Uh, if you could see down here, I have the shear glued onto the plug, and you might see the seams here. Okay, so, so I, I, I glued the plug into the part that I cut out, and I glued the shear plan over it. Okay, 
Now you come to shaping it. Okay, and I'm gonna start removing it. Now, some of the tools that I use, okay, and I'll just bring it up. I have a hand piece on a Dremel. I have a regular Dremel. I have... So, so what we're seeing is your PDF. If you're showing something live, I think I need to switch the view. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, you won't see that. Okay, never mind. Well, if you if you put up your participants, you should, you'll be able to see it. Okay. Anyway, well, it's a, it's a it's it's a dental burr. Okay, it's a dental burr. When I'm done when I'm done with this, I'll I'll cut off the screen share and I'll show you what I got here. Okay. Uh, making progress. The top photo shows the lifts trial placed together. The bottom photo shows the starboard side lifts with the trial stem, keel, and stern piece down here. Okay, the carving's complete, and I have some demos I'll show you, but you could see the inside carving and the outside carving is both complete. Note that the bottom interior lift is left in play, it is left full thickness. Okay. Tom, Tom, I have you in side by side mode now if you want to show something. I oh, still sure. had I still had Dodd uh spotlighted. That was part of my problem. Okay, so here's here's the compass that I use. Okay, and again, you just you just make the leg, you know, you you adjust it down so it's the thickness of your bulwark, maybe a little bit thicker, and then you just run it down your plug. You run it, you run it down, you run it down your plug. Uh, do it right, okay, to show the thickness of your bulwark. Okay, uh, this is a piece that's been cut out. Okay, and not completely, not not completely, not completely shaped, but you could see I have the thickness of the bulwark. The pieces that the things that I use to carve. Okay, I have a Dremel hand. I have a Dremel drill on a hand piece. Someday I hope to replace this with a Fordham. We'll see. Okay, um, some of the things I use. I use dental burrs. Uh, I'll even use an exacto knife. I'll use an exacto knife to uh, to remove a lot of material in a hurry. I'll use sanding discs with a Dremel. Once I have it down to where I want it, something that works well for me, and I think I passed this idea on to Ryland a while back for his mask and stuff. Scraping, especially with with harder woods, but even with basswood, works wonderfully. If you were doing full size work, you'd be scraping with a spoke shave or something or a plane uh, in the scales that we're working in. A razor blade works fine. And, and, and you know, a razor blade, an exacto blade. You can even get a curved blade, a curved exacto blade, and you could use it to scrape out for an inside radius. Uh, all these things work very, very well. Um, going back to the presentation, you notice that I laid in the ribs and I laid in the support for the thwarts. Uh, this is all done with card. This is all done with card. Okay. All right. And these are the completed boats. This is the 24 foot launch. I laid in uh, the planking in the bottom, the stern sheets, all the thwarts. The thwarts are wood. Um, um, the stern piece, uh, the the um, the ID card for the Ship Model Society of New Jersey when we had them used to be two ply plywood, and that's what I used. Okay. All right. And here's the 28 foot pinnace. And what's interesting about these boats is you compare these boats at eighth inch scale to Chuck Pizarro's kits. His, uh, I have one upstairs. I should have brought it down with me. I have his, his quarter inch pinnace and it looks the same. <laughs> now, um, these are all raw. They're not painted yet. Uh, I'm going to put some wipe on poly on them to seal the wood. And then I'm going to paint them. Um, in this period, uh, 1778, uh, Royal Navy, 
uh, the boats had different colors. All most of the holds were painted white, but the upper the upper shear was painted a specific color, so you could tell what boat it was from a distance. My guess, okay, also for decoration. So I will do be doing that. Um, these are two of the four boats that they that there that there are on the Liverpool. One of the boats is a um, is a jolly boat that's clinker planked and clinker plank is overlapping planks and what i'm going to do with that is i'm going to plank it with paper because uh paper is basically the right thickness for the overlap in this scale and there's the comparison of the two you'll notice the sterns okay i didn't do rudders or anything on this because they're both going to be on the liverpool so the rudders would not have been shipped at the time Okay, and this is the two boats up against the Liverpool. They'll mount in the midship section. There'll be there'll be there'll be four skid beams, and then these will mount on the skid beams. Also on the skid beams will be a spare top mast, so the boats will be lashed to that. Interesting uh, story that some of you folks probably know already. You know, you'll see. You'll see a, you'll see some boats with the boats mounted upside down, and I thought about that, and I read some uh, I think um, seamanship in the age of scale by uh, by Harland in there. Interesting thing about that is in many cases they left the boats right side up because they basically used them to gather drinking water when it rained. <laughs> so so. Um, so that's so that's what I'm doing, and that's it. Uh, any questions? Nice job, Tom. Okay, no questions. I will stop sharing. Thanks a lot. Okay, you're welcome. And uh, you know, anybody wants? I think uh, I sent Greg the PDF. So if he wants to, if he wants to put it where somebody could, you know, use it for reference, fine. You want me to make that available to the club or public? Um, you can make it available to the club. Okay. Um, I, I do have a question. Um, initially, you said when you reduced the the, uh, the scale of the boat uh, by removing a center section, I'm presuming then that the period boats were uh, of different sizes typically had the same framing uh, spacing is, is that what I'm understanding okay yeah well all right I, I, I misspoke not scale size you're reducing the size of the boat from a, from a 32 foot from a 32 foot pinnace to a 28 foot pinnace yeah, yeah. And, and 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 the spacing between the, the thwarts were all the same okay okay yeah uh, the framing spacing was also based on basically the same. So what you're doing is in quarter inch, in, in, in eighth inch scale, I'm basically reducing the size of the plan by a full inch. So what I did is I took, I took, uh, I counted up the number of thoughts that I was going to need. And luckily the way they were spaced, I was able to take out two thoughts and it worked exactly. Okay, okay, so this is not a, a typical practice then. I mean, it, at some point, the framing spacing would vary between the size of the boat, but since they were so close, uh, right. so then, uh, because the reason I'm asking, obviously, is uh, the Olympia probably has a dozen different boats and, and launches of, uh, you know, just a couple of the difference, and this would be a perfect way to, to, to rescale a one design boat into various boats if they're close if they're if they're the same quote unquote type boat and they're close enough together this works okay right. uh i do know like like for olympia that you're working on one of the things that draw that drives me crazy about these great white fleet ships is they have all different kinds of sizes of armaments and dozens of different size boats so you know, it's oh i know i know <laughs> And that's one reason why it's sitting in the corner and I'm working on a DE now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay.
Any other questions? None? We're good to go, Greg. I'm mute, Greg. Greg, you're muted. Thank you. Thanks, Greg, you sound great. Yeah, yeah, thanks. That's not what I like. Uh, so that concludes the meeting. Once again, we won't be meeting at Smoke, unfortunately. Oh, no. <laughs> <clears throat> Maybe no. next time. Hey, second banana. I have one question for you, real quick. Like, how, how familiar are you with with uh, with naval ships and spaces and stuff? I mean, there was there was a component on the D 